Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Welcome to another session of the Dark Stoa. This is an outdoor session. I don't know if you can hear, but we got a bunch of birds that have joined in this time. Uh, feel free to message me if that's annoying and I can find a way to deal with it. Um, for those of you who are new, these are weekly sessions where we explore pretty out there, harrowing, horrifying, essentially threatening ideas. Um, and it's through the wisdom of Pat Ryan, the most dangerous man on the internet. The structure is always the same. We have a, about a 40 minute lecture where Pat takes us through first principle reasoning of some out there idea with a mic drop moment towards the end. So it's very rewarding that you stay with the chain of reasoning. I want to encourage everybody to do that. Um, there's also some secret drinking games that go on at the same time. And in the part two, we get to ask some questions. So I encourage everybody to, even if you, you don't follow everything, to kind of make note of things that are unclear, uh, especially make note of things that you want to challenge Pat on. And then if you have any interesting insights, then we'll go into a Q&A round in part two. Last week, we talked about alchemy. Uh, this week, actually, I'm not sure what we're on about, but this season is about uh, using principles from the blue church to dismantle the blue church, if that means anything to you. Uh, and just a reminder, this uh, will be recorded. So if you don't want to show up in the Q&A period and you want to ask a question, you can put it in the chat and I can ask it for you. And with that, I uh, give you Pat Ryan. Hi, folks. Welcome back for round four, round four of season two. Um, this one is going to be about neuromythologies. Um, uh, neuromyths are things we tell ourselves when we try to define the brain. We try to say that, oh, the brain, you, you've heard these myths. You've heard them. They go like, uh, um, use 10% of your brain, right? That's a neuromyth. That's not actually true. You actually use all your brain. Um, so there is a collection of these neuromyths that every civilization has, and it ends up being used to justify certain actions and certain moralities and certain assumptions about the world and society and ourselves. So it's important when dismantling a blue church to attack the neuromythologies that they utilize as well. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that's exactly what we'll be doing tonight, and uh, I'll try to make it worth your time. Thanks much, and here we go. Boink. All right. Neuromythologies. Boink. So this is uh, still exploring this meme. We're almost done. Uh, probably one more of this and we'll be out of this meme finally. Um, season one was talking about the future. Season two is talking about now. And in this particular talk, we'll be going over these wonderful concepts. And it's all related to neuromythology. So we got to start at the beginning with neuromythology. We're going to start with Egypt. So they, uh, they practiced mummification, as you know. And when they began the mummification process, they would start with pulling the brain out of the nose. Uh, and that would be either pull the organ out or stir it up and then pour it out, whichever. Uh, it varied in different regions of Egypt. That process is called excerebration. And uh, well, <laughs> the reason why they started with the brain first um, because they didn't understand what the brain was and the literal translation of the brain was skull awful. If you don't know what awful is, it's like, it's like the refuse. It's like the garbage meat that you'd buy at a store or like literal crap and trash around everywhere. It's literally worthless meat. Um, so the Egyptians thought the brain was worthless meat. They had no idea. They didn't care. Um, that's the more I think about it. I think that's true of a lot of people, but you know, they could be fixed. Um, in fact, there's one case where they went through a mummy and in the process of, uh, of digging out the brain, the tool broke off and it just stayed in there. I don't know. I mean, they didn't really care about this stuff at all. They just, they didn't, they just wanted the brain out of the head. Um, and then, you know, and meanwhile, they would preserve other organs like intact, like really, really down in great detail. The kidneys, the liver, uh, they, they dose those in drugs to really get, like, embalm them for as long as possible. But they didn't, they did not want the brain in that skull at all. So the neuromythology of Egypt was the brain doesn't matter. I guess you got to start somewhere, right? So then we get to Greece, where this guy comes along. Um, Ac Acmeon? Yeah, Acmeon. So 
So Acmeon was known for dissection of corpses and humans. Um, and he would threaten people to chop you up <laughs> if you die. So he kind of won a lot of arguments. Anyway, he's the guy who came along with the idea that the brain was the seat of human intelligence. He, uh, he poked and prodded and, and around different uh, war victims, for example, uh, soldiers coming back from wars or, or people uh, harmed by soldiers, and noticed that when they had head damage, um, they were acting very differently. Their, their character had fundamentally changed. Their soul was different. And so he was making the correlation that, well, maybe this skull awful isn't what we think it is. Maybe it's something specific to intelligence and our very natures itself. Of course, it, it took uh, a lot of head trauma to make that association. Um, but humans are slow, and I guess we like ourselves that way. So um, he is celebrated in the Blue Church uh, because you, right here in this red box, you'll see physician, he, basically he said that, Physicians should draw conclusions from empirical observations instead of divine revelations. So this is more blue church uh, uh, jabbing and seed laying. The idea that oh you know we have to we have to you know science above all you know and that that's that's blue church's morality because with science they can actually justify their policies and everything else. And this is this is a hero of the blue church for that. Uh, then we keep going. We get to the medieval era. Now Aristotle obviously not medieval era, but he was a heavy influence of the medieval era. Uh, his his training and and a lot of his almost everything he wrote was devoured by most learned people of that time. Um, so he came up with the idea of common sense or census uh, communist, uh, which is so he didn't agree that intelligence came from the brain. He thought it came from the heart, right? So he said it was like this heart thing, um, and this is where the soul is, and this is where all intelligence comes from. And the reason of thinking that is because you can remove a lot of things from the, from the human body and you don't die. But if you remove the heart, you do. You can even remove parts of the brain and you won't die. So the heart seeing as this like very fundamental organ, they just made the assumption, well, that's, that's where the soul is. Because if I remove that, you're dead. It's very easy logic to come to the conclusion to. So it's not, it's not that his reasoning was faulty. Um, it was fairly sound, really. Um, although he did say that the brain was a cooling agent for that soul, which is interesting. Um, he might have been right. I'll get to that. So then Gallen comes along and he says the brain is uh, where all these common senses are actually commingling. Oh, and by the way, it's made entirely of sperm. That, uh, I wish I was making that up, right? That, they, that was a commonly held opinion all the way through the Middle Ages for multiple cultures. Like you may have seen like in China, you see like sometimes you see these cartoons and I couldn't find it because I couldn't remember the name of it. I wish I did. Um, but it's usually this old man, his forehead's like really enlarged and gorged. And he's like, in a, he has like a cane and he's like, he's like old and he's always smiling. Well, the Westerners look at that and think, oh, what a funny little guy. But everyone in China knows that's a fucking pervert. His head is full of semen. That's what it means. <laughs> So he's, it's like, so this is a, this is a multicultural, co like commonly held assumption for almost all of history that the brain was full of sperm. And to really drive home my point, uh, Leonardo da Vinci would draw anatomy in which the dick was connected to the spine because the spine was a tube to get the sperm out of the brain so it can shoot out the dick. <laughs> so this, this was really well like held, this whole concept. Um, and I may have focused on the PP for too long. So let's get back to this part. Um, so the common senses are commingling in the brain. That was Gallen's contribution in addition to thinking the brain was a sperm tank. Um, so so we're, we're, we're slowly iterating here. You got to give these guys credit. <laughs> um, and then Descartes comes along. And Descartes basically fucks all of us. Um, he comes along and says makes a humongous leap that the brain is in fact not a sperm tank, which is very observant of him, thank you, um, and that the pineal gland is the seat of the soul due to its subtle asymmetry. Now that's interesting. The idea that most of the brain is symmetrical uh, is well known and, and well understood even by even in uh, pre-modern times, um, but the pineal gland is actually a little bit off. It's like a tiny bit off, right? So because of that asymmetry, it was actually, it's unique in the brain. And using that reasoning, uh, Descartes basically said the pineal gland, pineal gland was the seat of the soul. Um, 
And of course, that, that leads to uh, pineal gland memes mating with eye of raw memes. Because boy, they kind of look similar. And then, which goes on to mate with Hollywood memes to create Illuminati memes. And all that, uh, you know, it's all fun and games until you realize, wait a second, if you get pineal gland tumors, they actually accelerate puberty in children. Hmm, that's uncomfortable. So one wonders why they focus on the pineal gland so much. But anyway, um, this was considered the seat of the soul and held for until, I mean, they were doing penolectomies in the 1920s. Uh, it wasn't until they started um, trying to figure out melatonin production where they would uh, take an animal brain, uh, animal, animal pineal gland, blend it down, and then you had melatonin, which you could then, like, they would inject it in the salamander, and the salamander would turn colors. That's how they figured that stuff out. Um, but this, this was a held, this is still deeply held by some more wild sex of, of different cults and things as well. So, you know, it, it has a lot of sticky power, that particular neuromyth. Um, so we get to the modern era. Now we can laugh at all that primitive interpretation of the brain, right? Yeah, we're modern. Yeah, uh, just kidding. We're just as stupid as they are. Um, in fact, Descartes thought uh, that the brain was kind of a hydraulic pump. Uh, Freud compared it to a steam engine. Carl uh, Pryben thinks it's a holographic storage device, and most people here think the brain is a computer. So the I, we keep coming up with these dumb neuromyths. They're bad analogies. They don't help. They're feeding bunk science. It's all crap, really. Um, and this is by Gary Marcus, who is a fantastic resource, by the way. He wrote a book called um, The Mind, The Birth of the Mind. I highly recommend it. It's a fantastic book. If you're coming from a coder background like me, um, he was able to take some concepts about information theory and apply it to the brain without saying the brain was a computer, which was really masterfully done. So it's a fairly old book. It's like 1990-something. It's a good read. I recommend it. Um, but he correctly points out that here, here we are doing our best to describe what is effectively the most complicated machine we could think of and say that's just like the brain, which is all throughout history. Like the most complicated thing in Freud's time was a steam engine and Descartes' time was a hydraulic pump. And it's stored, you know, so that's all we're doing. It, we're, we're, we're just like thinking the most complicated thing in engineering is our brain. And we're always wrong about this. But these are neuromyths. These are things we tell ourselves about the brain. Um, and why is this, why am I focused on this weirdness? Well, because according to this fantastic study, um, where they took educators, normal people, and people who were exposed to actual neuroscience, and they asked them a bunch of neuromythologies, is this true? Is this not true? Well, 68% of people believed in the neuromythologies. And people who were actually neuroscience oriented, 46% of them believed in the neuromythologies. So it's a really ongoing issue where we come up with this really bad analog of the brain and then everybody uses it. And you can't even question the damn thing because so many people are, are interlocking believing it. It's almost like a, a holy war to a degree. Like there are people running around thinking the brain is a quantum computer. And if I call them out on that, they'll probably you know, yell at me or throw fish at me or something. It's pretty bad. So here's, here's an example of these common neuromyths that a lot of people buy into. Uh, left brain versus right brain. That's a very common mythology that people tend to think like, oh, uh, left brain's organized, right brain's artistic, and you know, they're just fighting in the middle. Eh, no, that's not true. The brain is way more complicated than that. Uh, we only use 10% of our brain. That's a mythology. It, that it, this is like, oh, well, you should, we could be using 90%, right? Uh, no, you are using 100% of your brain. You just don't have like conscious control over it, and you're fucking lucky you don't. Because if you did have conscious control over your brain, you'd probably forget to breathe and fall over. So you don't want <laughs> to have manual override on your own nervous system. There's good reason for that. Uh, people have learning styles. This is one of those sticky myths. Don't approach like new mothers with this type of shit because they buy this stuff and they will, they will fucking yell at you all day long. But there is no such thing as a fucking learning style. Um, you learn things unconsciously all the damn time. Like you will, we have, we have demonstrably done this to where people are, we can train someone on very subtle, on very subtle signals to do something. So for example, when I don't like a coworker, um, 
I'm a very evil person. Um, when I don't like a, when I don't like a coworker, I will, uh, God, what, what did I do? I think I was like, I would do, I would make a noise every time a certain event happened to the point that the coworker started looking for the noise when, when that event happened, I, but I was just training his, his subconscious system. Um, so there, people learn even, you know, learning isn't this like, I'm going to sit down and hit the switch and now I'm in learn mode. No, it doesn't work that way. You, you're always learning. Uh, brain development ends upon puberty. This is wrong. Brain develops. It's always going on. It's always going on. But this is a common neuromyth. 48% of neuroscientists believe this shit. Learning is from new brain cells being formed. No, <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> it's, it's, it's how they connect. It's not, it's not new pathways. Yes, not new brain cells, right? And you were born with a fixed mental capacity. Again, not true. You have to define what mental capacity is. So these are, these are common mythologies. And a lot of people buy this stuff. And it would be silly in and of itself, because it is. But unfortunately, these myths, they become the justification for policies, like really rushed policies. And I'll give you the most powerful and dangerous neuromyth that we all believe in, in some capacity or another. And that's the neuromyth of equality. That is a neuromyth. And why is that a neuromyth? I'll show you. Clearly, these organs of my body are the byproduct of intelligence, you ignorant creationists. Not the brain. The brain's magic. Brain can't be the product of, of evolution. Because if it is, then you're racist. Because there's differences in brains now. There's difference in how they process. Oh, no. Now we can't use science for our precious science. And if we want to use science to protect our precious science, we'll just say neuroplasticity. They'll say, oh, my, my brain will do anything. I'll, I'll turn into a, a barstool if I, if I just, you know, change my plasticity enough. So this is an example of a neuromyth where the science is pretty strong over here, but it's intentionally denied over here and pretty aggressively denied. Um, now, admittedly, this wasn't done in a vacuum, why this is denied. So we should probably explore how this got denied so hard. Um, it's because the neuromyths justify behavior, policies, and reactions. So let's start with the wild ass neuromyth of the three fifths compromise. That's a pretty fucking wild neuromyth, if you ask me. It's a very dangerous and deadly one, too. The idea that black slaves are three fifths of a human, obviously not their brain part, right? That's the, that's the neuromyth justification behind slavery. And then you have Galton's dream of improving the human genetic stock where they want to get rid of the low IQ people and they want to promote the high IQ people. Again, a neuromyth that is justifying policy. And then a dolphin Hortler is running around. He wants to improve the dolphin genetic stock. Again, we've, we've seen what that, how that turns out. That doesn't turn out so hot. What is his secret plan? Hmm. But you know, these are, these are neuromyths. The idea of, of the, uh, the dolphin race having like a, ba a better brain. So, you know, neuromyths, they justify really fucked up policies. So you gotta be real careful what neuromyths you actually believe in. Because that, that, you know, on this side is gonna be challenges to this. If the three-fifths compromise is rationality behind slavery, then you have, you know, this guy shows up, comes up with a couple of dogs and starts training them to do complicated actions. I mean, if I can train dogs to be differently, obviously we can train these so-called three-fifths humans, you know, so what's the fucking problem here, right? So that's a, that's a successful challenge of it, right? And then when you're trying to improve the human genetic stock, you just end up in endless dysgenics where people are just rebelling against it. And then, oh, geez, now we have to use our entire civilization to make sure that that one neuromyth never happens again. So it, you have to be real careful with what neuromyths you subscribe to because if you, didn't, if you didn't fall for the trick over here, you'll fall for the reaction. And when white women cry, we all know we gotta we gotta listen, right? We gotta we gotta get our we gotta get our civilization. We're gonna stop this neuromyth by using even worse neuromyths. <laughs> it's it's so ass backwards. And then again, how does this? You know, let's let's keep exploring this justification why why we're not allowed to apply evolution to the brain. Um, so the observation is brains should be uh, treated differently because they're because they are differently. My brain's not your brain. Your brain's not my brain. Where all of our brains are pretty fucking different. That's, that's a no-brainer, but um, right? So uh, justification, my brains are the best and their brains are whack. 
uh, that crazy dolphin, right? Uh, and then uh, the reaction is all brains uh, should be, all brains are equal and should be treated the same. That's how you react against the dolphin. So then uh, people have dispositions and preferences. That's a fair observation. The dolphin runs, comes and says, no, there's only the dolphin way. And then the reaction becomes, I can train any human to be anything at any time. Then I care about, you know, people care about their tribes, a fair observation. I really care about my tribe at the expense of someone else's. That's the dolphin. That damn dolphin's violent, man. Um, and then the reaction is going to be, we should care about pe all people equally. So, wh so what are we doing? We're, we're here. We're in the reaction phase against the neuromyth. We're, we've, we've pivoted our entire civilization to make sure that this neuromyth isn't allowed to happen. And in the process, we've embraced utter trash neuromyths. Absolute trash. Oh, and by the way, this guy's benefiting from all of it because he gets cheap labor. He can fire artisanal labor whenever he wants and everyone's equally worthless now. So this is, this is what happens. You, this was a bad neuromyth. We can all mostly agree to that. We, that's a kind of fucking angry dolphin, right? This is not a better neuromyth. This is not better just because it's not this. Because it's still resulting in fucked up things. So you got to be careful with your neuromyths. And we are, yeah, you are here. It, it doesn't get better from here, by the way. Sorry. So what is, what is this? What, what, what does the neuromyth manifest? What does it make real? What behavior does it justify? Especially in a democratic tradition where every person is worth the same vote. No matter what your background is, no matter what your neurology is, no matter what your experiences are, you are all the same vote. And then you mix that up with equality obsession, the neuromyth of equality, and then you mix it with psychographic liberal capitalism and it's clown world. It's clown world all the time. So obesity is the idea that I'm exactly the same as someone with discipline because I'm equal. My neurology is the same. That's what matters, right? And then hysteria and Gerardian harder. If I'm doing bad faith force making, if I'm screaming at you, if I'm yelling at you in a threatening force, that is exactly the same as an intentional stoic doing sense making. In a world of equality, it is exactly the same. And the reason it's the same is because of the neuromythology. My brain is equal to your brain. So it doesn't matter what my behavior is. It doesn't matter what I do because my brain is the same. And then you get callous altruism and what forest where equality means I only need to care about the outliers and I don't need to care about the median. <sighs> And then catharsis, denialism, and, state, uh, and stasis, where, the, where you, it's a never-ending crusade of redefining the median. You can't get catharsis. You can't actually beat the demons you're inventing, because if you do, then your crusade's over. So we got to redefine the damn thing all over the time. So we deny ourselves catharsis. So this is, this is the clown world. This is what the neuromyth has made normalized. This is what it made real, and we're all living in this all the damn time. No breaks, no exit no way out. And it only gets worse from here. And this is all because of the neuromyths. We've, 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 we've dedicated a, a warring crusade against one bad neuromyth, and we are now enabling even worse ones as a result. So instead of trying to come up with prescriptions about the brain and say the brain is this thing and it's that thing, and trying to champion my personal neuromyth the most, I'm going to step back and say, let's not do that for the next 10 minutes, right? Let's say, why don't we start looking at not what the brain is or what the brain should be or how we can use the brain to justify morality. How about we just find the dependencies of the brain? How about we find the limitations of it? Because there's a lot of assumption in a lot of the neuromyths we believe in that the brain is infinitely plastic. It can do whatever it wants. It can, it can uh, be wired here. And I, I, I was a chef yesterday and today I'm a skydiver and look how plastic my brain is, right? Um, that's, that's the mythology we tell ourselves secretly and sometimes openly. Um, but th th let's not do that. Let's just find the dependencies. Like let's find the structural limitations of the brain and figure out from there. Let's do that instead. So I'll walk you through it. First thing we're going to focus on is uh, neurons, the limitations of neurons. That's a that's a, that's, a, that's a forbidden phrase in the blue chart. You're not allowed to say for limitations of neurons because they're magical and they're always right. 
Um, so in this case, uh, most cells perform mitosis, but not the neuron. Neuron does not perform mitosis. And it has a fully functional nucleus, by the way, completely functional. DNA is there, you know, everything's doing its job just fine, but it doesn't go through mitosis. That's an interesting limitation. And that's indicative of something. The reason we look for the limitations is so that we understand the structural biases so that we can understand why the brain even exists to begin with. Because if we're going to put so much focus on this damn thing and use it to justify this endless clown world shit show that we're in, perhaps it's worth looking into the cognitive, the pressures behind cognitive evolution. If we're going to endlessly come up with neuromyths, you know, let's find the dependencies. Let's figure out how this damn thing evolved. And this is a, this is a, a very good piece of evidence about how the brain evolved and why the brain evolved. More, more importantly, why? So this is a clue. This is a clue. And then temperature. Most people don't know about brain temperature. They think, ah, it's, it's a brain, right? Bro, no. The, <laughs> it is not. You only have one Celsius degree bandwidth to work with. So the brain's in the temperature that it's in, and the largest distance between any part of the brain, uh, if you measure all the temperatures of all parts of it, between the highest temperature and the lowest temperature is one Celsius. One. That is a remarkably narrow zone that you have to keep your temperature in. And to keep the brain there, that is a miraculous piece of work. In fact, uh, it's uh, if you if you get, you know, you start bringing your body temperature up, 70% of information that's normally retained is lost at 35. So if, even if you go for, you, if you start at uh, 36.7 C and you drop one degree, 70% of information is now lost. You're not remembering it. Just one fucking degree. That's wild, right? That is a crazy, crazy narrow, fine tuned result. And then the brain is uh, it's compromised of 2% of the body mass, takes 25% of your total glucose and 20% oxygen consumption. This is a metabolically demanding organ with intense heat production. This is generating heat all the time. And even with all of this like firepower and horsepower, it still has to maintain that tight band of temperature. And then this one is, yeah, and in, in different states of temperature management. For example, when you are deeply anesthetized, your temperature drops. Your body temperature drops when you're an, 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 uh, anesthetized. The brain temperature drops, I mean. Um, and when you sleep, uh, it rises and falls with sleep as well, and arousal as well. So, so this, is a, this is another clue. Why does the brain need this temperature? That's the question you would ask. It's very important to have this. It's doing its best to have it and is consuming a tremendous amount of your biochemistry to make it happen. And yet it's still able to dissipate heat like a heat sink, like a fucking finely tuned heat sink. That's really important. And then we look at stimuli. Uh, quick science lesson, a photon is a byproduct of one atom reducing its energetic state. So pew, that means for every photon, there's one atom at least. And when we're talking about a light bulb, light bulb at around 100 watts is generating 300 quintillion photons per second. So that's uh, 300 quintillion atoms changing their energy state per second. And your eyeball, both of your eyes are only receiving 400 million of that. Wait, what? Wait, hold on. If you do the math, you're only seeing this much of the light bulb. That's it. Not just the light bulb of every single thing you're looking at. You're only seeing that fraction of reality, of me, of your hand, you put your hand in front of your face, you're only seeing that percentage of it. Where's the other, where's all the other information? What the, what the fuck, where, where, where did it all go? Turns out your brain can't handle the truth because it's too much information. That's a key piece of evidence. It's the stimuli, the brain is intentionally reducing the amount of stimuli that's available. It's going through a filter process. It's saying it doesn't need everything. It just needs what's important. What's important? Well, we'll get there in a moment. Let's look at the topology of the brain. If you adjust the volume, the weight, the size of this brain, that means the neck muscles have to change, the bone structures have to change, your endocrine system has to change, blood flow changes. 
it's a it's a structurally expensive process to fundamentally change your brain. Uh, it, that's why evolution is so damn slow. That's why evolution is so damn slow. It's because of the brain. Because in order for the brain to make any change, it has to change the entire body first. So all of these things have to be synchronized as they move. They have to move very slowly because the, the, the dependency chains are very complicated. And it's three pounds of every reason we've ever been wrong about anything ever. So you got three pounds, roughly. And then the, uh, the Jerry and the, and the Sulky, they are not found in most animals. Most people think that the brain, uh, that, that wrinkling is found in all animals. It's not. It's found in elephants, it's found in humans, and it's found in like 20 other species. It doesn't exist for most of the animal world. And furthermore, while this looks random, these little divots and these valleys and these foldings, these foldings, they are consistent between individuals, meaning the foldings in your brain are very consistent with mine. And this is across races too, and genders. So these folds matter. It's not just throwing a bunch of neuroplastic, man, it can solve everything. Ugh. No, there's a very specific structure going on here. It's very, very specific. So let's look at, let's summarize these dependencies. Uh, and so we've analyzed them. We've said, okay, here are some interesting limitations about the brain that will give us clues to why the brain even evolved to begin with. Um, and we're gonna start by looking at where have we seen these problems elsewhere? So we have um, uh, footholds to work with as we explore these, these clues. So uh, the folding packs more neurons in the same space. That's a limitation because your skull is an actual physical limitation. You can't just get more skull. It doesn't work that way. So you, you got to pack, you got to really just stuff that, you know, it's like stuffing a shirt in a, in a goddamn like potato chip bag or something. You're just, you know, just crumpling it all in. Um, where have we seen this activity before? When it came to miniaturization and exception driven chip fabrication, you see the same exact thing. You're just packing and packing, reducing and getting it further down. You're stuffing more transistors on the damn thing. You're just, just going balls out as hard as you can using every hack and every tiny fractal optimization you can find to get more and more on there. So there's a constant pressure to get neurons as packed as possible. That's a guaranteed given. The neurons that are existing within, the, within your body, they are there as a byproduct of your chemical support, your biochemical support systems, what it's actually maximally capable of given the, 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 uh, the metabolic um, extreme consumption that the brain has. Changes in the brain mean changes to the anatomic and support systems. So like I said, I, I got to change so many things if I change one part of my brain. Um, that's why every, everything goes so slow, evolution. Well, we see the exact same problems uh, when we're engineering for effective escape velocity. So it's the exact same issue where I need fuel to leave the planet, but to have more fuel, I need more structure, which means I have more weight, which means I need more fuel to move the more weight, which means I need more structure, because now, now I'm just caught in this fucking loop of crazy. Um, and you have, to, you have to get real specific about your, your mass, your rocket fuel, and your velocity ratios so you can actually achieve escape velocity. It's a very fine-tuned issue. And the same is true about, about increasing neurological um, uh, structures and changes. Temperatures have to be within a one Celsius zone. That's, that's crazy, right? Um, this is the same thing we see in finely tuned sensitive quantum computers. They need to operate at very, very specific temperatures. Oh, Raven, your, your mic's on. Um, the, uh, uh, so this is, these, these are problems we've seen in other computation devices and you have to solve for that. And we have massive, gamers have massive heat sinks on their, on their CPUs, right? Neurons can't go through mitosis. Uh, same thing with ma uh, maximum transistor counts. You can only pack so many transistors onto the uh, wafer. In fact, we get, we get to the point where we actually can't make transistors any smaller. So you might have noticed that um, CPUs have been pegged at three gigahertz for like the past 20 years, despite all the advances that are going on, breaking that three to four gigahertz range. Well, that's because of quantum physics. You actually can't get less than like six trans, like six atoms for a transistor. Because once you go below six atoms and quantum fluctuations just break the whole thing apart. And so you don't get a reliable um, uh, band of electricity going through it. 
So we found the, the, the most optimal atomic configuration for the transistor, and now we've pegged our counts. Well, the neurons have done the same thing. They, they cannot go through mitosis, which means the number of neurons that you have are optimized. It's not like they can go through mitosis and get more on demand. You, you get what you work with, you, you, you get what you have. The brain is not selecting for sensing atomic reality. Remember the photons, we can only see so many of them. It's not seeing atomic reality. It's seeing a holograph of reality. Reality is the holograph, right? So we see this in compression, uh, decompression and psychophysics algorithms. Like the MP3, for example, the way the MP3 works, why it's so small. Typically an MP3, uh, a recorded sound wave should be like, I don't know, 60 to 80 megabytes, but an MP3 gets it down to three. And the way it does it is called psychophysics. So um, there's only certain frequencies that we actually hear with a high level of clarity and everything outside of that range is garbage anyway. So we don't need to pack all the information at the high and the low frequencies. So you just strip those entirely and then you just focus on primarily the 2K to 5K range of frequency. And then you compress for that. That's a huge part of, of the MP3 being so tiny as it is. But it's not the actual song but it sounds like the actual song. It sounds like the actual recording. Your brain doesn't know the difference. So that's, a, that's an example of a psychophysic algorithm. And it turns out uh, for the visual cortex, it's doing the same thing. It's only picking uh, upon reality that's important that you can care about and everything else is just garbage that the brain doesn't care about. And then brains are uh, metabolically gr greedy and they can imbalance glucose and oxygen economies. Uh, we've seen this in contract enforcement, financial forecasting, game theory, you know, if you screw my access to resources, I screw your access to resources type of thing. So these are the clues of the limitations of the brain. So we can actually like be responsible with our neuromyths instead of just being reckless like we have been. Oh, excuse me. Um, and here's some examples of where we've seen these limitations just to have an analog to kind of like get the problem. So we're trying to understand how to build a responsible neuromyth. So it probably helps to understand what the brain may be doing. So we're going to start with some, some premises here. We're going to say that inside this bubble, this is the permanent noise factory that is the universe. This is the universe is just full of information and matter, and matter and energy, and it's all noise. It's just nonstop fucking noise. So it shoots out a photon from this noise, pew, a little photon comes out. Hits the physical interface of the body, which intercepts the energy and either moves, and either the body moves towards the energy or away from the energy at the very minimum. Then it goes, starts the neural cascade, which then fires roughly at 180 miles per hour up your arms or through your nervous system. Um, and that's converted into, an, that energy is converted into a neural equivalent, a neuron equivalent known as stimuli. It's not, it's not like the photon is running through your body. It's the impact of the photon on the nerve that, that's going up your body. If it's, if it's heat in particular, I should say if it's heat in particular, you'll feel that. But if it's uh, an optic nerve, or not, uh, uh, I'm sorry, optics, where I'm, you know, it's actually hitting the cones and the rods, it, it's not the photon literally going in my brain. It's, it's the excitation of, of the nervous system. But that excitation is a representation of the photon. And that's the important takeaway there. So then it goes into the brain which I'm starting to think uh, as in terms of a symbol economy. So I am a collection of atoms uh, and you see my hologram based on this understanding of energy exchanges and how the brain is perceiving reality. And in that hologram, it's going into your eyes, into your brain, and you're creating symbols about me. Now, why are symbols important? Symbols are important because if you had to constantly update, if you had to constantly see reality at all times in order to make sense of it, if I just did this and you didn't have a symbol of me, you had no symbol processing, you would be asking yourself, where is that voice coming from? Well, you already have a symbol of me in your head. So there, you have the representation of me. I don't need to be here at all times. So we're actually, we're creating this like constantly incorrect and out of date map of reality in our brains at all times. And it's always, it's, it's always out of date, but the brain still works with that information because it's better than nothing. 
even if it's not permanently in sync at all times, that's okay. We can, we can get by, we can make it work. And then, oops, sorry. Um, then the uh, energy economy, those symbols, they require biochemical consumption of glucose and oxygen to form. So in your body, there is also a signature being generated for every symbol you are processing and handling and dealing with. And that is a, that is a unique signature too. And if you want to check out um, uh, Carl Friston, that's, that's Carl Friston stuff right there. He's talking all about the free energy principle and, and whatnot regarding Bayesian brains. But there is, a, there is a biochemical signature of every symbol in your body, every symbol that get, gets made in your mind. And then the thermal economy. Remember, we got that one band of seed we got to work with. That's super tight, and you got to stick to that band. So now the biochemical consumption has to be converted into the thermal equivalent too. So when you get a symbol in your mind, there's a biochemical consumption, and then there is a thermal consequence. And the, and the interaction between these three things is like a triangle. It's unstable. So I should say it's the most, it's the most minimum stability you need is a, a triangle in order for something to, to stay self-regulating. So this is how you are generating the universe in your brain, roughly, and at a, at a mid-level, not, 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 not a high level, but a mid-level, right? So we start with that objective reality, and as we get further and further along in this process, more and more of objective reality fades away. And as we go more and more in the process, symbolic reality takes over, the hologram. The symbolic reality is the only reality you've ever had, and it's the only reality you'll ever have. And that's not to say that we're dumb and we need to fix this problem. It's the fact that we, this isn't even a problem. This is the result of all of the efficiencies and all of the equilibrium and all of the balance that our brain has evolved to handle. It doesn't want objective reality. That's going to kill it. It will literally kill the brain trying to understand objective reality. You will run yourself out of glucose and oxygen uh, pretty quickly if you started seeing every atom. This is bad news. And so from here, we get our reality filter. So the balance between the symbols, the energy, and the thermal creates what it is we're actually looking for from this permanent noise. Maybe we're a bee and we're looking for flowers. Maybe we're a crab and we need a, we're a hermit crab and we need a shell. Maybe we're elephants and it's time to bang. Maybe we want to talk to each other. Maybe this wolf is chewing on this lamb and they're all cute. I don't know where I got that picture. Um, but the symbol economies in our head they're stabilizing with the energy economics within our body as well. So the reality you're seeing and everything you're seeing and everything you can conceive of is the signature of economic efficiencies. That's a wild way, that's a hard thing to grok. The idea that reality looks the way it looks is because that's the most efficient balance between energy thermals and and meat space that's a very very weird thing to think about um but according to this it might be right so let's 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 run with this a little bit further if we're going to craft a neuron myth out of, out of this um the neuron can be seen as dna bypassing its own structural limitations now how can that be well we'll, we'll take our We'll take our model we were exploring, look at our, our reality filter. I'm just some, instead of, uh, you know, this whole thing, it's just going to represent it as this. So here we are, my reality filter. It's time for me to interact with reality. I'm going to say, ah, from this permanent noise factory, I need, I don't know, I need a birthday cake. Okay, so I need a birthday cake, whatever, I just need one. So my filter reality, I'm going to write into reality this very long beautifully, exquisitely manicured explanation on why I need a birthday cake right now. Very long post, but it's cognitively expensive to write all this stuff and build it all up. I had to burn a lot of biochem. I had to generate some heat. I had to have that heat piped away. I had to go recalling through my memory and I had to go through my symbols and keep my social relations in track. This is a cognitively expensive operation. And when I throw it into this void, nothing comes out. Not a damn thing comes out. So I spent all those resources and I got nothing and I still need a birthday cake. Okay, let's change my messaging. This is cognitively cheap. 
Oh, look, six brains popped out the void. Well, holy shit, there is a economic game going on in our communication that is driven entirely by this and this. This is cognitively cheap. I just said one word, and now I got six brains. I had the attention of six brains. I got you. I got you all, and it wasn't expensive for me. Now somebody get me this fucking cake. And that was it. So now I've been able to command from the void the thing that I needed. So evolution cannot optimize neurons any further due to these economic limitations. Instead, it is selected for neurons to summon each other. So, so the idea of making a cyber brain is a joke. It's pointless. The idea that we can just change evolution and we get a, a better brain, that's, that's a joke too, because we see the economic costs associated with all that, all the complex bean counting and balancing that's associated with it. You can't do it anymore. So the neuron has bypassed DNA. DNA goes through the evolutionary process in a random haphazard manner. The neuron says, nah, no, 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 we're, screw that. We got our own way, thanks. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna summon other neurons for our moment. For, hey, come here, do this thing, okay, great. So we're actually optimizing for communication and socialization and, and getting to know one another. So with that said, we can now make a shot at a neural myth proposal. I'm gonna call it cognitive thermodynamics. So here's how it works. You have input. It's, Energy, mass, that's the input. And you have the output, which is emotional behavior as neural summoning, as neuron summoning. So it's, I'm not, if I'm, if I'm yelling at someone, it's not because I'm emotional. It's, if, I'm, if I'm happy and I'm laughing, it's not because not I'm emotional. My emotions are serving a purpose. They're serving a function. They actually do something. And what they do is that is the shortcut the brain has figured out to summon more neurons. So, hey, I had this emotion. You see the emotion. You're either attracted or you're repul repulsed by it. If you're attracted, great. Now we can share neurons. Now we can actually share cognitive space. We can tell stories. We can do all these things and we can work together. I can offload my cognitive demand onto you. And now we're working in parallel. That is a very much easier solution than trying to grow my brain bigger. And it's a lot less dangerous too, unless I'm an asshole and then you punch me and then maybe the neuron summoning needs to take a chill for a bit. But what about all the stuff that input, so this, this implies an input and an output. What about all the stuff I'm taking in that doesn't become behavior? Where does that go? Well, that's heat. It's ideas, thoughts, symbols. So all of our ideas are heat. The brain evolved like a heat sink. That's the parallel. So the, why this neuromyth is useful is because it actually destroys all the bad neuromyths. It completely eliminates them. Now, how can it do that? Well, for starters, uh, the behavior is trash can go kick rocks. Uh, they're running around saying inputs everything. And I, if I control the environment, I control the brain. And they have some pretty compelling science behind that. Yes, it's true. Um, but I don't like you as a human, so fuck off. And then we have... Uh, then you have the uh, incomplete moral doctrines determining what your behavior should be. You know, your behavior should be this and you should do that and you should do this. Well, they can go kick rocks too. Because now my emotional behavior has a purpose. There's a reason behind it. And so if I start looking at my neuro myth like this, instead of saying I have to subscribe to or defeat some moral doctrine, no, I know what emotions are doing now. I know what their function is. I know what it's supposed to be. Okay, it's just neuron summoning. Simple. And then bye-bye hyper-individualism. So instead of your ideas and your thoughts being a representation of you as a person and your personality being so bound up in the holographs you're consuming, get the fuck out of here. It's just heat. So what we've done is we've eliminated all the neuromyths by embracing this one. So your brain is no longer your identity. You are not in Descartes' prison any longer. You are free. And it was a cooling agent. After all, he was right. That's it. Thanks, folks. Well, thanks again, Pat, for another really brain bending session. Um,
think like a, a background message in what you're saying that I, I want to clarify is that all, or are you suggesting that all explanations, because they're fundamentally like in that symbolic realm and not objective realm, are destined to be normates? Like we'll never actually touch what's going on? You're on mute. Thanks. The neuromyth is exclusively the series of collections we try to attach to the brain in the hopes to understand it. Um, regarding the simulation uh, that we have, the holograms and the symbols of, the, of reality, I mean, I ran through the numbers. I mean, you're not seeing the whole light bulb, right? So what are you seeing? Um, well, what you're seeing for is you're, what you're extracting from reality are things that comport to your neural summoning strategies. So it could be mating, it could be finding friends, it could be working in, with people, whatever. So your, your neuron summoning strategies, because the neuron has hijacked DNA at this point, it says, nope, we're going we're gonna to change this up. Um, it hijacked it in the sense that um, it started driving the show a little bit in terms of uh, economic equilibrium internally, all the biochemistry. So um, in the process of doing so, the neural summoning behavior you're engaging in that we've been all engaging in for at least the last million years um, has been very much towards tribal attitudes, uh, you know, Dunbar number tribes and stuff like that. So um, in terms of that being a hologram, yeah, it's a hologram, but it's also the only damn thing you'll ever know. And that's okay. I mean, we're not out here trying to rationalize Camus or, or, come up with stuff like that but um but ultimately the, the general conclusion is that yes it's a hologram yes it's all you're going to know it's okay that it's all you're going to know and trying to think that you can find more you might you can you know there are techniques we have to explore that objective space to see what's repeatable according to the scientific method and then we have alchemy which you can use to figure out the black boxes we have a whole ecosystem of tools that are now at our disposal to use and we should be using all of them so we shouldn't be relying on these eco, these um, these neuromyths to uh, to do the driving for us anymore. There's there's almost no point. I, I guess that's what I'm saying. Um, just a reminder to everyone in the room. Um, just if you have any questions, drop them in the chat, and I can call on you to ask them. I'm gonna keep going with some of my own in the meantime. Um, I guess uh, one of the things I'm curious about is if you have a definition of fitness here i know you didn't really use that word but that was what i was thinking about um like is it darwinian fitness is it fitness of you know ideas that are able to replicate uh because of the wide diversity of neurology that exists on this planet and you i'm almost i, I almost said the n-word with neanderthal but i didn't so you don't drink um given the wide oh. variety of you got to take a half sip i didn't finish that sentence um uh the uh the wide variety of, of neurology that exists, what that's indicative of is it's showing all kinds of thermal survival strategies. It's all kinds of different heat sinks doing what it is that their, that their behavior and their bio organic, um, I'm sorry, their biochemical consumption is, com is, is making possible. So it's not that fitness, fitness might not have ever have been a thing. Um, it's just the, if you look at the entire species performing an activity, instead of just inter, interpersonal um, uh, interaction between uh, competition, either for mating or for food or for territory, even that um, is part of the thermal equilibrium that the brain is trying to do. Remember, all, all the symbol processing is cognitively expensive. It's, it's energetically expensive. So I need to do neuron summoning to maximize my input so I can keep my brain running. So the brain is like this, it's like this bicycle. It has to keep moving. Uh, and if you stop pedaling, it all slows down, falls over. I need those resources to keep my brain going and I need to go out there and cooperate and hunt and, and compete and all those types of things. So fitness, fitness might be too, too granular. Um, I'm, I'm talking, there's something even above that. And that's, and that's this, this thermal pressure, this, uh, this energy thermal pressure, comp, um, not competition, but this, this balancing between the symbols and thermal and energy consumption. That's what's driving the whole show. So with that, I, I know that you know, the, the grand devil entropy is somewhere around the corner here. Can right. You spell that out for us. Yeah. So um, entropy here is like, uh, I mean, this is, I mean, this is all, you know, the whole thing is driven by entropy to a degree. Um, but this is kind of a way to where, 
um, how can I put this? It's not that a fitness is happening. It's not that it's a glorious fight against entropy. Think of it more like if entropy is always there, reducing everything down to the minimum. That's all. It's, it's, not, it's not increasing disorder. It's constantly reducing down to the indivisibles. It's trying to take any complicated system and say, shake you down, what's left? You know, what's left? Okay, just these atoms, that's what's left. Okay, let's rebuild from there, right? So if you go through that process with that entropic driver and so much energy and so much matter going on in the universe, what you end up with is infinite possible combinations of what can endure, infinite poss possible combinations of what is able to resist against this entropic shaking down to irreducibles. And so the neuron appears to be one of the better strategies in terms of achieving that. So it's, it's, it is absolutely a child of, of entropy for sure, just like DNA is. All right, we got a few questions coming in, in the chat. Uh, last one for me is related to AI. And I think you kind of made a comment about this, about how creating like cyber brains is a waste of time. I don't know if that's has anything to do with AI. Um, but I, what I got from that, and correct me if I'm wrong, are you suggesting that there's nothing more efficient than what evolution has produced? And I guess my like, follow up to that is, what if, what if evolution just reached some sort of local maximum and there's actually a global maximum somewhere else that we could potentially reach? The key here is to make sure you're defining your, your parameters for optimization and efficiency here. So can we get better efficiency um, in the brain by changing its configuration structure? No. And I'm going to, that's a shocking answer to most people I know. And the reason I'm saying no is because any attempt to improve efficiency of the brain is not actually improving the efficiency of the brain. What you're doing is you're selecting for certain combinations of the brain that are more beneficial than other ones. So you're not actually improving um, efficiency here. Uh, if I decide to say, well, let's remove this part of the brain that controls, I don't know, belief in God, for example, there's a whole army of people who would say, yeah, that's pretty efficient. In fact, there's 68%, I actually know the number, 68% of people would say that's efficient because it's a neuromyth, right? So um, the removing that, who does it create efficiency for? Is it creating efficiency for the person? Well, that person doesn't have a belief system anymore. So what's the penalty? What's the, what's the thermal penalty? What's the energy penalty? How is that person engaging in neuron summoning? What, what types of, we aren't talking efficiency anymore. What we're, we're talking about is, is a circular uh, zero sum game really where you have, I eliminate that part of the brain. Now I fit better in this system. I mean, we've seen this all the time with, with pharma, uh, pharma psycho, uh, psychopharmaceuticals. I mean, that's technically doing what you're asking where it's shutting down parts of the brain or enhancing it or making certain emotions not appear. Is that efficiency? That doesn't strike me as efficiency. So, you know, we've seen what, what neuro tinkering does, uh, getting finer control over it and not having to bombard the brain with like a pack of, I don't know. I don't know what all the kids are doing these days, heroin. You know, just like it, dousing the brain in, in these type of drugs. Um, sure, that might be a bit carpet bombing solution, um, but I don't think snipers are going to get you any better because you're just shutting down parts of the brain uh, that evolve for a very specific reason. So if you're talking efficiency, you first have to define your economic order that you're selecting for, really. Well, clearly you haven't tried modafinil, Pat. I have not. <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to hand the next question over to Hannah, and she has a question about the collective consciousness. Hannah, mm -hmm. do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, uh, and I can try to give a definition of that if needed, uh, but I'm kind of wondering where it fits in terms of like, is it more on the neuro mythology side or is it more on the neuron summoning? Uh, like, is it a methodology of doing that? So, the concept of collective intelligence? Yeah. That's a very good point. It could be a little bit of both as well. There, there's definitely plenty of neuromythology around coming together and collective intelligence and the internet and this type of stuff. There's, there's almost endless amounts of neuromythology around that concept. Um, is there truth to it? Yes, there is truth to it. The idea of when you, when you do the neuron summoning and you get the brains together and the brains do the thing, that's real. That's what we've selected for. Um, 
So yeah, we do have a collective uh, intelligence making, sense making process. It's very tribal, it's very early and we use it all the time. Uh, we actually, <laughs> our entire concept of aesthetics and beauty actually comes from that as well. So the, uh, uh, that does absolutely exist. Can it go beyond Dunbar's number? Well, yeah, it can if you reduce the amount of information that you need to track about a person. So for example, if I'm, if I'm looking at, uh, I can know 300 people in Dunbar's number, but I, only, but I can know like 20,000 unique words, for example. Um, that's quite the mismatch, right? That's a huge mismatch. That's because words are, are neurologically cheap and faces are neurologically expensive. The, the Dunbar's number isn't just like a, a, a constant in a script where you say 300 and that's it. Um, that, that number is a peak, is, a, um, is an emergent peak in this equilibrium system between symbols, energy consumption, and thermals. So that number is that way because of how you process symbols. And that's another one of those uh, clues about how the brain is working and why it evolved as well. So if I'm tracking 300 faces and I know them all in detail and I know their personalities and I know their relationships, that, that is the collective intelligence sense making you're talking about. If I reduce the amount of information about a person, if I say, well, that's Bob and that's Joe and that's Sally, I'd say, okay, I got those people. But if I wanted to reduce their information, I would say, oh, they're all Democrats. So what you're doing is you're creating a symbol for all three of those people. But the problem of making simplified symbols is that that falls prey to the tribalism as well. You say, oh, this symbol's bad. And everybody associated with that symbol's bad. And so this is, this is what constantly breaks the collective intelligence sense-making process uh, because we use symbols to shortcut this whole thing to keep track of it all. But they also fall prey to tribal, um, tribal behavior as well. So... Um, People try, they, I mean, we're always trying our best to, to maximize uh, neural summoning. That's what empire is. That's what civilizations are. They're attempts at maximizing um, uh, neural summoning, basically. But uh, if you mismanage it, and it gets real easy to mismanage, well, your ability to summon neurons go bye-bye with it. So empires rise, empires fall, as they say. If I may, I want to have a follow-up to Hannah's question. So the way I understood collective consciousness was more so the subjective experience that people sometimes report of on psychedelics or after meditation of being all one being and realizing that consciousness is some sort of distributed thing that expands beyond our selfhood. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. There, there is some pretty strong, um, there's some very strong evidence in the fMRI space that shows when one is intentional about their thoughts, um, you are focusing on different domains of data and you're focusing on different domains of, of stimuli. So for example, if I wanted to, if, like, if, you, if everyone sat here for a second, just like breathe and then just said, I'm now going to focus on my heartbeat. You can actually slow down your own heartbeat, for example, right? Now, you're not, you're not doing this consciously. It's not like you're petting us. It's not like I grab heart and no, I'm actually controlling a very complicated biomechanical orchestration in my own body. And I couldn't tell you how the fuck I'm doing it. I couldn't tell you like, this is the machine I press and I use these fingers and I, and I couldn't even tell you how I do it, but I can do it. So when you're, wherever your focus is and your attention is, you're going to extract all the information from it as if it was a human face. So here's what I mean by that. The human face has a pile of information associated with it, which means that's what we're used to consuming. So if I put my attention anywhere else, all the information I'm getting from that focus is equivalent to the information I would get from a human face. So if I'm focusing on my heart, I'm focusing on all the complicated shit around it too. I'm watching for all the like the tiny little, did the smile turn a certain way? Is his head turned a certain way? All that subtle nuance we're constantly processing. Well, now I've steered it into my heart. I've, I've steered it into my programming. I've steered it into my work or I've steered it onto this, this mental experience that I'm having. So yes, we, we, we have a huge capacity to just drink data from whatever it is we're, we're focusing on because of the human face thing, the, the, the neural summoning that we're always uh, checking for. Uh, so as a result, you're, if you take that focus and you put it somewhere else, you're going to see shit and feel shit and do shit you can't explain. Quips, would you like to ask your question on overclocking? Um, sure. Um, what was it? 
I think me and Anjan had similar questions, so I might write, read out both of ours if that's okay. Sorry, just your avatar is killing me. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. Um, uh, I think, yeah, I said, uh, can we overclock the brain by using future tech to manage and mitigate these limitations? Uh, um, overclocking, uh, yeah, overclocking basically means consuming more biochemistry. Um, so as long as you have this like tube of glucose that's just dumped right directly into your neck when you overclock it, then maybe. I was about to say, because oh, someone said, just strap heat six to your head. <laughs> I, I, I love, but um, I, I imagine it would be more complex than that. You would have, yeah, bi biology, uh, heat, thermodo, you know, like yeah. many different factors to, to actually manage and mitigate. Yeah, um, that's a lot. If you don't mind, Daniel, I was just about to type in a second question. May I ask it? Go for it. Um, my second question is, it seems like the limitation hacks that you've been mentioning on how the brain has gotten, aw gotten away with observing so much with so little data, um, lean, it leans heavily on multiple brains interacting. You said, mm -hmm. mentioned like these emotional outbursts and stuff like that affecting mm -hmm. wants and needs and desires upon mm -hmm. other, you know, interactive brains. Does do these hacks fall apart in a hypothetical situation where there is exactly one brain in existence? Uh, the thing about, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a hypothetical fun thought experiment that you can control. And I've seen some of the more barbaric attempts at trying to recreate that experiment. Um, if you put someone in solitary confinement, for example, or someone is born without the ability to engage in, um, seeing or hearing or their sensory information is gone. So that's, that's a close proximity to that scenario where a person is born completely sense, sense dead, uh, yet they're alive. Um, so in those cases, uh, because the brain, the brain did not evolve on its own in isolation in a vacuum, it is carrying the perceptions, the instructions and all of the equilibriums um, that, that shaped it, it's carrying it with it. So it's still going to operate in a human sense, looking for those human things, engaging in the human ways, um, because the, the brain really does have its own opinion on how things should be perceived. Mimetic Caper, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. Um, so if our brain's output is merely tactics for summoning more neurons, might such tactics take on a life of their own? Are symbols merely a byproduct, or might they be the instantiation of neural summoning tactics abstracted from individual brains? Right. So the thing about um, um, and that that goes into some of my earlier theories regarding the formation of morality um, and why that thing kind of keeps happening to us and why we even do neural myths at all. Uh, we know that neuromyths, the collection of symbols that do make up neuromyths, do lead to pretty wild ass behavior. Um, so yes, what happens is when we make these symbols in our mind and then we have our behavior coming out and it's attracting more neurons because that's what we're ultimately selecting for, that's going to create more symbols that we have to manage. And if that symbol just happens to lead or represent or make a bunch of people act a certain way repeatedly, we're going to rely on that symbol. Uh, this is this is why you see religions use uh, religious symbology all the damn time. It's a it's a very quick it's a very quick way to pass um, that neuron summoning lesson without having to reteach it over and over and over again per generation. You just simply pass the symbol down to the next generation, and poof, everything is already encoded, ready to go, locked in, programmed in, ready to rock. Um, so even that is an efficiency. So these symbols do take lives of their own. Yes, that's true. Um, Andrew, you had a question earlier. I'm just going to paste it again in the chat. Would you like to ask it about drugs and or medication? Oh, yeah. Because uh, you were talking about uh, objective reality, like the brain can't uh, uh, doesn't have objective reality or I was wondering if drug if you think that drugs and or like meditation is like an attempt to have objective reality and is that useful it, it, it kind so I uh, think uh, think of it like this um, this camera that's looking at me right now you see a square right so everything in this square is kind of me except this stuff this is not me 
Um, and then everything outside of that square is who knows what it is. It could be anything. Uh, all I have to do is move my camera and you see it, but you don't know. So there is a, there is a limitation to the information you can take in from this square. If I modify the electronics on that thing, I might get a different interpretation. I could get a different filter, a color, a different hue. Maybe I can put an AR thing on top of it. Maybe I can modify the image somehow if I start tinkering with the internal uh, electronics. But there's no tinkering that's actually going to expand this box. You have to physically change the hardware of that camera in order to expand the box. So if, if the drugs aren't changing the hardware, or at least if they are changing the hardware, if they're not changing them in a meaningful way that allows you to take in more neurons and thus expand this box, um, then you're not gonna get objective reality. Because, because, you're, because even before the information hits your brain, your senses are already doing hard filters on the amount of information you can get. Um, and so as a result, you're, you're, kind of, you're kind of at the whim of that. Oh, uh, so like this kind of, real, uh, uh, kind of just for me to grasp this, is it like that drugs are just kind of changing the perception, but not the objectable reality? Yes, that's correct. Yes. So the, the drugs okay. are changing. Uh, well, they are physically changing the brain too. Uh, LSD is notorious for that. Um, and there has been endless amounts of studying into LSD to try to do exactly what you're talking about. Uh, between the Germans and the CIA, they were dumping LSD on every goddamn living thing on this planet in the hopes to create a super brain that could see objective reality. Every single one of those experiments failed, by the way. Um, they did not work at all. And they got into more disastrous and insane and insidious types of trialing in order to try and somehow keep that hope alive. But they're unlimited money, unaccountable assholes. They are getting to the point where they're dumping LSD in kids for God's sakes. So <laughs> it, was, it was a fucking disaster. Um, and they never achieved that a dream. They never got it. So um, we could argue that perhaps their techniques were wrong, which they were. Um, we could make the assumption that perhaps a better chemical needs to be evolved and that will magically change your brain. Maybe CRISPR will do it. Maybe this will do it. Yeah, that'll do it um, for sure. I mean, uh, I know the Neanderthal brain process, drink a drink. Um, we, we use CRISPR for that. And it does physically change the brain. The neurons themselves look like fucking popcorn. Like they don't look, they don't, that's not an axon. It's not a dendrite. It's, it's popcorn. Nobody expected that. Um, so yeah, you can CRISPR and change stuff, but that's not the point here. The point is you still have to account for the, for the energy consumption and the thermal management as well. Just you know, changing the brain itself isn't enough. You have to you have to get the equilibrium of everything that makes the brain possible also right at the same time. Okay. So Thanks. next week, can we do the dark stoa on acid? I can do this the whole study on it. Yeah, I think it might be the timing <laughs> might, might be good. Might need oh, <laughs> everyone else on acid. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, second last question. Um, Anjan, you had a question about planning our lives in light of some of the things that Pat says. Can you ask that question? Hey, thanks, Pat. That was an incredible lecture. Um, <clears throat> I'll just read my question. Um, you've mentioned that the coming century is a century of psychology and neuroscience, that it's hit an inflection point. Why? What's the inflection point? And what are the implications for that in planning our own lives? Yeah. Um... The inflection point is that we have done the maximum amount of neuron summoning we can do in our empire building games. And with the advent of the nuclear weapon, um, our ability to explore more neuron summoning has completely evaporated. Um, meaning we cannot use geopolitics to solve our neuron shortage problems anymore. Uh, and when we do play geopolitics to solve our neuron shortage problem, uh, what ultimately ends up happening is um, it results in, in Dunbar number violations and cultural conflict and unstable stuff there. I mean, I can point to any number of genocides in any number of places. I'll throw a dart somewhere and a genocide happened because of, of, of cultural conflict. Um, so we've, uh, we've hit our hard limits here. And so we've doubled, tripled, quadrupled down on trying to create good enough neurons with silicon. And that's been going okay. That's been doing some stuff, but the real win here for silicon is the fact that AI came or neural networks came on board. I mean, it's in the name neural network, the bastard child of the neuron. Um, so what this is allowing us to do is it's allowing us to overcome certain parts of our neuron shortage, not all of them, 
um, but just certain parts of it. And the parts that it allows us to cover right now is the genomic space. Because there's so much data associated with uh, DNA research and so much about genomics, um, the, art of the, the artificial neurons uh, are assisting us into going into that space. And once we start connecting genomics to connectomics and we can start making predictions on that, we're at the inflection point. It's, it's over, right? So um, what does this mean for our daily lives? Uh, I mean, if you're really close to the stuff that I'm talking about, um, it wouldn't hurt to listen to some of these <laughs> lectures first uh, before you start playing CRISPR brain games. Uh, I've been there. I can tell you how it goes. Um, but the, uh, m for the average person who's looking at this stuff, um, there's a reason I'm promoting alchemy. Uh, it's the safest thing you can embrace. It's the safest neuromyth you can embrace uh, because you're going to see chimeric cognition. You're going to see bots running around that look and act just like humans. Um, you're going to see humans going psychotic in this place at the same time. Uh, so the alchemical neuromyth is actually a useful way to navigate this upcoming insanity when we start dealing with different, when we lose our, we're going to lose our monopoly on sentience. Um, and when we lose that monopoly, um, we don't know what that looks like. We don't know how to act about that. I'm, I'm not, I don't think we're going to act very kindly about that. Uh, and so these chimeric brains and these AI brains are going to be running around making interpretations of law and morality, and they're going to influence us. And we're going to be like, where's the democratic process, gir giraffe slug raven brain? Um, and it's going to be like, law what? You know, I have no idea. And well, <laughs> who do you even petition in such a situation? Uh, so so the, the alchemical neuromyth is a good start to um, start looking into in order to keep your fucking sanity in this, in this mess that's coming up. All right. Uh, Key, bring us home with the last question. Hi. Thank Hello. you for the presentation, as always. Um, okay, you keep saying, bring us home. I don't need to be the last question. I really do not. I'm going to say that out loud right now. <laughs> like, at, I understand this tradition. Peter referred to it as a ritual. I'm just putting it out there in the recording, I don't need to be the last question. Thanks guys. <laughs> like you can ignore my question if you want, it's okay. Um, yep, and then there was something about straightening the picture, that'd be great, you know, it's okay, you know, it's behind you. Yeah, that, that came up a couple of times, I'm sorry. It's, it comes into my brain um, while I'm reading. And then there was also a question by Todd about temperature differentials, and I'd like to say that I value air conditioning a lot now, and my friend has said the same, so thank you for that. Um, I will read Todd's question because I, I appreciated it a lot, which was, um, are there any psychological states that improve our temperature differentials? I'd assume anxiety, depression, and other mental states disable capacity. I really like that question. I just want to keep it there while coming to the question that I asked, which was, oh, I wanted to thank you for speaking of being intentional about our thoughts. That's been really important to me. Um, recently in the past and continuing onwards. The question is, you mentioned, uh, are we optimizing for communication and getting to know one another um, or for birthday cake or, <laughs> or um, the attempt, okay, so the attempt to see objective reality. Um, that's much appreciated knowing that we only see 0 0.00000, however many 0.6% of photons. Um, and wanting to understand reality more. Great. Um, do we do that via neuron summoning, which you've already said a lot about, which I'm still processing, to be honest, or do we do that through meditation? And that's great because Andrew brought that up, but is it a worthwhile goal even to be able to see objective reality? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, first, uh, the first part about modifying brain temperature. Uh, yeah, we, we actually do that all the time whenever we go to sleep. You go to sleep and your brain temperature goes, it goes down. Um, and then when you're on um, anesthetics, when they knock you out, your brain temperature goes down. Um, so there, I'm, I'm sure with those two things, there are drugs that can emulate that. Maybe even being drunk brings your brain temperature down. Um, but also, you know, it's, it, it doesn't just target the brain temperature. The reason the temperature is going down is because the, the, bio, uh, the biochemical fuel is burning less. 
Um, so as a result, temperature goes down. So you're not engaging in symbol management any longer, or at least another part of your brain is going into single, symbol management mode while the other parts don't. So there's, there is definitely reproducible um, biochemical evidence of, of modifying brain temperature. I don't know if it's as simple as willpower. Um, I suspect there may be some willpower trip, uh, tips that you can do that can either reduce or bring it up. Um, when you're in a state of anxiety, for sure, because uh, your brain temperature is going up because your endocrine system is on fire, your adrenaline's going on. So you're, you're getting more details about reality. So that in turn is burning more glucose and oxygen. Um, so yes, that will increase the temperature of, of the brain. But, but your fluctuation is going to be uh, within that 1C band for the most part, for the most part. Um, uh, if it goes beyond that, well, then you lose 70% of all information that's going on anyway. So it's, uh, it's there, yes, there are, there are ramifications about brain temperature and depression for sure. Um, then the second about optimizing it, trying to see, real, are, we, are we optimizing for each other? Or are we optimizing for birthday cake? Um, I would say why not both, but I think it's we are optimizing for each other to get the birthday cake. Um, because to get a birthday cake is a lot of, it's a lot of work. You gotta, you gotta farm the grain, you gotta beat down the grain, you gotta cook the damn thing, but you gotta get the logs to cook it, then you gotta start the fire, but then you need the metal to start the fire. Okay, well, now I'm cooking it, but then I need a, the, the place that can actually do the cooking, and, and now I need, a, I need a cow so I can get some milk to get some butter in that thing too, and I gotta go find a cow and, you know, you know convince it to you know, give me milk. And then I got to let it age and process it. There's a lot of complicated economic factors that make that birthday cake. And so in order to get that birthday cake, we had to select for ourselves. Because we need this economy to work in order to make the birthday cake. So by selecting for ourselves, that's how we got it. Um, so we're not actually, op if you're optimizing for the birthday cake, think of it like this, right? The more complicated, like uh, I say that entropy is the process of reducing down to irreducibles. If this is your base state, this is like atoms, right? There's a small tribe, like the further we get from the base state, the more unstable things become before entropy comes by and just grinds us back down. So the birthday cake is like, like here, right? You need to have a functioning civilization to make a birthday cake. <laughs> that's, that's quite the dependency. Um, but to get that functioning civilization, you, you need people selecting for each other. And so the, the last part of that question, is this even worthwhile? Is, is, the, is the civilization that generates birthday cakes worthwhile? I don't think so, but that's just me. Um, I, I think civilization can do some other interesting things that we've forgotten how to do. Uh, maybe it'd be nice to take a break from the birthday cake every so often. Um, but that's a matter of personal taste. So, you know, you can dismiss that. Um, I, th I think it's, I think it's probably up to each individual to figure out what it is they want from the civilization because it's the only game in town. So you better, you know, make peace with it somehow. All right. Awesome answer. Thank you so much for going into details. Yep. Thanks Key for your final question. And thanks Pat again for another wonderful session. Thanks everybody for partaking. I'm just going to hand it over to Peter, who's actually right next to me somewhere, to plug some events, and then we'll close it up. Cool. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, uh, Pat. Um, so I'll just plug one. Uh, tomorrow we have Vince Horn from uh, the famous podcast, Buddhist Geeks. It's coming at 3 p.m. Eastern time to do uh, a session on social meditation. And I'll just read a uh, Part of the copy meditation is bringing attention to experience and training and meditation is training and attention by this definition neither isolation nor silence is required we can train together and that is good because together is what we were born for so if that uh appeals to you you can uh, rsvp on the website uh, it's still at .ca. cool and on that note let's call it Thanks again for another wonderful session of the Dark Stoa. See you all next week. See you around. Thanks, Pat. My pleasure. <laughs>